Good afternoon everyone. Thank you for joining myself for this video. We will be discussing the general properties of integrals and I am Mr. Ish. You know what we've been talking about integrals. So far we've been talking about definite integrals. What are definite integrals? They are those type of integrals which have a certain defined interval within which you're doing your calculation of your function and that calculation is called uh, integration. Basically, when you have an interval a comma b, a clearly defined interval for your function and you're integrating over that interval, we are basically talking about definite integrals. There's nothing undefined at all about a definite integral, so keep that in mind. There is such a thing as indefinite integrals where you have no in interval defined and you're just doing an integration without the presence of an interval and that's called indefinite integrals. But right now and up till now we've been talking about definite integrals. And well, I want to discuss some general properties of integrals in this video, so it should not be a very long video at all. We'll just discuss the basic properties before we get into the mathematics of integrals with these upcoming future videos. If you are looking at a certain graph and I'm here graphing a quadrant one graph, let's, let's say I'm plotting here only in quadrant one. If you have a given function like this, from here interval A up to interval B, and this right here is represents some F function, right? this right here and you know the area of this function will be everything over here within this interval below the curve if you supposedly have another function and you and that graphs something like this from here to here over this interval these uh, graphs these curves can continue beyond the interval but i'm only showing you the curves for this f and now for this g but only within this defined interval or right here the interval between a and b and if supposedly you can uh, mark the area under the G curve like this, see all the dots represent everything below the line. Everything below the G function line is the area of the G curve and everything below the F function line is the area of the F curve. Uh, one of the properties of integrals is that within a given interval, if it's defined for both of those functions having the same interval, you can add them up. And this is what I'm talking about. Here's one property of, inter of integrals over the same integral f of x dx if you do the integration of function f over the same interval and you add it to the integration of that of the g of x you can actually arrive at this property such that you are starting initially with this f of x plus g of x dx that is one property of integrals you can actually have a combination of integrals such that you can see that the areas would be cumulative. The areas would be cumulative so that in the end result you will have a, a total area, a total area of all of this which would represent f plus g. You can see over here and I want to clarify in terms of handwriting. If you have two functions over the same interval, let's do it neatly, over the same interval f of x plus g of x dx or the same interval they represented by this the separation of the two integrals you can separate them but over the same interval see a and b a and b intervals are the same but this right here is a representation of this an equal representation which shows that individually their integrals will represent a combined sum not two of a abstract thought process involved over here to understand that all you're saying is something like this and let me use letters x and y if you're looking at something which is x and you're looking at something which is y, these are separate. These can be equally written as this, x plus y, under the same heading, if you want to say it that way. You see, individually they're x plus y, but combined together they're still x, x plus y. So mathematically they're both the same and that's what you're showing over here. The combined effect of the addition of two integrals over the same domain can be equally written in this way or in this way. That's one of the properties of integrals. There are other similar properties like the one which I just showed you, the addition property of integral. There's one which is also the difference property of integral. And you can show it like this. We don't have to graphically represent all of these because you can understand how the graph would be. Look over here. Over the interval of A to B, if you have an integration which is represented by some difference over here, you see there's a difference over f of x minus g of x. And if you were to integrate this, you could actually write it again separately as this. You can do f of x, the integration of f of x separately 
with the difference of that of the g of x you see how you've separated them out there's nothing wrong with you doing that and these type of separating techniques whether it's for minusing or positive come very handy when you're doing integration of something more complex likewise another important property is this the constant property if supposedly you have a you can use any letter over here let's just say f of x if you're doing the integration of this over a defined integral see defined integral has a defined lower endpoint and an upper limit upper endpoint, upper limit, lower limit, lower endpoint. You can say either endpoint or limit. They're both representing the same thing. You see this constant over here? A constant can be like a numerical value, a fractional value, anything. But so long as it's not a variable, but it's a clearly defined numerical quantity. You can write it out separately outside of the integral as such. Because just like in derivatives, you could take the constant and push it outside because it was not really affected by the derivation process you could separately bring it out and then reattach it back at the end likewise you can do the same thing here with regards to integrals you can take out this constant do your integration and bring back the constant what i'm talking about is supposedly you have something which looked like this forget about the fact we're talking about definite or indefinite i'm just talking about here in an example format if you have to do the integration of this you can just bring the two outside and then just do the integration of the x square component only and then worry about the two at the end once you've done the integration of that that's a constant property of integral and likewise you can see there's a difference property and the addition property which i already pres uh, prescribed to you all in the previous image let's look at some more properties of these integrals here's another interesting fact that you'll see if you are graphically showing a function, and I'm talking about here only a single function over a given interval, and we're talking about a function, let's just call it f, and we're talking about an interval a comma b. Look over here. If supposedly you can graphically show the function as such. Heck, for creativity, we can even say, let's make it a and c. Let's make it an interval a comma c. There's not, no, nothing wrong with using a c over here. It doesn't have to be a b. Now look what I'm going to do. If this right over here represents a, the lower limit and this right here represents c the upper limit for a given function which is continuous over this entire interval of a to c if you had another separation point over here and let's call that b now look what happens if you are talking about the same function you can split this entire function and its area under the curves over several functions now look and several does not necessarily mean two several based on how you split your interval could be many items look over here you can have this the interval from b to a if you do f of x dx because it's just a continuation this area right here is a continuation of that area you can add this to the interval of c to b see this interval c to b you always write the higher interval first and then the lower interval the previous interval below and f of x dx why is it f of x dx because we're still talking about integration of the same function It's the same function right the same function f you see how the interval has been split into two intervals you can also do you can view all of this in this way if if this interval b to a is graphically showing this and from c to b you're graphically showing this you can add these simply by writing on this so long as it's a continuous function and so long as it's the same function now look what i'm doing over here we can do uh, not only just addition or here we can look at these in terms of subtraction or differences if you're talking about this entire interval from c to a you can write this as c to a the entire upper limit c all the way to the lower limit a for the function f of x and if you were to minus from here just this interval right over here c to b look c to b f of x this is really nothing more than just a numerical manipulation that's all what it is except this manipulation happens to have the banner of this integral sign so it seems like more complicated than what it really is but it isn't now look over here. if you take the difference of this if you're taking this entire area and minusing this area you're only having this area left and you can write that as this b a f of x dx and you can see this graphically and you can see this numerically all of this will play out you're seeing how it plays out if you're looking at the combined area and you minus this area of course you are left with the remaining area and you can easily represent that as this you see how this manipulation is going on because that's all what it is manipulation using the properties of integrals so long as the function is the same you can add these subparts into the total this entire block over here, here on the top, would actually equal this. It would equal this C A F of X 
dx you can see that see this component plus this component equals a total component the total component minus any of the individual components equals the remaining component nothing new over here except you're just seeing this in terms of integrals let's look at some more properties now i'm going to show you two very interesting properties or two very interesting let's say phenomenon or phenomena if you have a continuous function if f is a continuous function you know what a continuous function is that it's a smooth line with no breaks in it. Look over here. This right here is a smooth function. This right here is not a smooth function. You see there's a break in it. I'm talking about a continuous function over an interval A to B. You see here the interval A to B? This is a non-continuous because there's a break over here. This right here is a continuous. So I'm talking about this type of a scenario right here. If a function is continuous over an interval minus A comma A, look what the interval I'm using, a minus A comma A. I'm not using A and B over here because A and B was only being used to represent, uh, to explain what a continuous and discontinuous function was. I'm talking about interval minus A to A. And you know, when I'm talking about interval minus A to A, I'm talking about from a minus X axis to a positive X axis. Look over here. If you're talking about a symmetric function and the function is continuous, but there's no break in it and it's going from a minus A to A, I'm going to show you this graphically. But here's one of the situations. If the function is even function, you know, thinking back to pre-calculus what an even function is. If f is an even function, you know the test for an even function is that f of x is always equal to f of minus x. All right? For an even function, if you are able to demonstrate this test and we're talking about the interval minus a comma a, you would represent that integral, the function or this integral minus a to a f of x dx. And if you were to do this integration process, you would kind of be wasting your time because you'd be doing unnecessary work. Because for symmetrical functions over this interval, and it happens to be even, you can simplify your this initial expression and just make it into this. And I'll show you in terms of an example what I'm talking about. How is this more simplified than this? Because here you're dealing with a minus a up to an a. Here you're dealing from an origin. And I'm talking about x axis values, the domain values. From zero to a is much easier to calculate and just multiply your answer by two versus calculating the integral from minus a to a and then do all of that work. This is an easier process than this. So keep in mind for any time, and I will show you momentarily in terms of an example and graphically, if f is an even function and this is the test for an even function, you can rewrite your integral which would present normally in this form as this form. And we're talking about an interval minus a comma a. What's an example of a minus a comma a like minus two comma two. You see both a values are the same except one is a minus, one is a positive or minus 10 comma 10. You see these are minus a comma a. Both the a values are same numerically except it's a, just a difference of a minus and a positive. Now what happens with regards to symmetric functions which are, uh, remember you can have y-axis symmetry which are even functions. You can have origin uh, symmetry which are odd functions. For an odd function, if f is an odd function, you know the test for an odd function is this, where f of minus x is equal to minus f of x. If this test fulfills, you know you're dealing with an odd function, then over the same interval of a and minus a, if you start worrying about calculating the integral or doing the integration process, you're wasting your time. Why? Because in the end of the day, your answer will be a zero. Just like over here, if you if you're looking at a symmetrical interval from minus a to an a for an even function, you can simplify it in this form. For an odd function, minus a to a, a continuous function or this interval, it will equal in terms of the area under the curve as zero. And here we're talking about areas under the curves. The area under the curve for this interval minus a to a is just doubled but over this interval. For an odd function, the area under the curve is zero. Why? Because you end up having the cancellation of the areas the positive and the minus areas are equally the same in terms of numerical quantity. They just cancel out and you get zero. And now I'm going to show you this graphically. So these are two very important properties to keep in mind for symmetric functions. Now look over here for this very first clause. An example of a symmetric even function would be what? f of x is equal to x squared. Look over here. If I draw an x squared function like this, and I'm doing an interval from here minus a to a and we're talking about this area over here, and we're talking about this area over here. It's the same thing. 
you see this area right here will be exactly the same as this area over here and everything here is positive in terms of the y-axis you wouldn't have negative areas over here just because you have negative x-axis values everything in terms of the y over here is all positive see positive y values you have the same area right over here as you have over here so you can equally represent this from interval minus a to a you can just say two times the interval of zero to a you see from zero to a you can do the you can just do the area from right here to here and whatever you get multiplied by two and that's exactly what we're talking about when you're doing a definite integral then you're actually carrying minus values sometimes you can make silly mistakes in terms of dealing with the minus when you're doing the actual integration we haven't done actual integration yet because we haven't learned those techniques yet we're only talking conceptually but it's much easier to do from the origin to an a value than it is from minus a to a it's much easier especially for definite integrals now that right there is the example I wanted to present for even functions. You see how you have doubling of area over here. Now let's do the same but for an odd function and show you graphically why it would equal zero. And remember this entire discussion over here, one and two, these two points represent the points we're making for symmetric functions. They have to look exactly the same over your interval, minus a to a, on both the right and the left sides of the graph. They have to be same in terms of symmetry. Now let's look at an odd function, y is equal to x cubed. You know if you were to draw this out, you have a function which looks something like this. Now we have to of course represent the interval a to minus a. You have a over here and you have minus a over here. And you can represent this interval and this. And you know we're talking about this area right over here. Kind of the area above the curve. And here we're talking about the area right here but kind of the area below the curve. You know in these type of situations where you have negative you know, y-axis values. Here you have positive y-axis values. Here you'll have negative lengths. And you know all that discussion, we're talking about the Riemann sums, the negative lengths and positive lengths, all multiplied by the interval widths, which was the delta x. Well, here you have negative lengths, and you can view this as a difference of areas. The point is this, if you look at the calculation of this area right over here, whatever it might be, A2, and you look at this calculation of area over here, it might be A1. The point is numerically, they'll be exactly the same, except one will be a positive, one will be a minus, and you'll have a2 minus a1 both having equal magnitudes and you'll end up with a zero and that's what this is talking about for an interval from minus a to a where these are both same numerical values just differing only in signs and they're odd functions you end up having a net area or the difference of areas equal to zero and that's exactly what we're talking about you'll see questions like this where you don't have to waste time doing the calculation because you can recognize that it's an odd function and it has this type of a, a domain interval you can automatically put zero and you'll be good. So if you think back to some of the properties that I've I was talking about the addition property, f of x plus g of x over the same interval, over a similar interval a and b was the same thing as separating them out as saying a, b, f of x, d of x plus a up to b, g of x. This was the the addition property and I showed you subtraction property and I showed you the constant property. This is what hard this one I'm talking about how it plays out in questions. You could have a question which looks something like this two x cubed minus four cosine x plus so you can have three e to the x. Now I don't know if this is a valid function or not, but we can assume it is. You see how you have this difference and sum and you have coefficients. You can rewrite all of this using the properties of integrals. Why? Because sometimes it simplifies the process as the following way this constant can come out using the constant property you have x cubed dx each of these being separately placed into their own integrals i'm not worrying about an a and a b over here i'm just doing this for example say you can write this four out separately and you have a cosine x dx see each with their own dx values over here with respect to x they're independent variables you can have three come out as a coefficient over here of e to the power of x dx that's what i'm talking about these types of properties with the plus and the minus plus and the minus and with the coefficients enable you to separate out examples like this and make something which looks complicated into something more easier to handle how about something which looks like this four secant square x over three if you were to do the derivative of this then you can actually separate over here this constant 4 over 3. You see 4 over 3 you can separate out as secant square x dx. You can do all of these types of manipulations using these properties of integrals and they actually vastly simplify. Right now you might not appreciate how these things simplify because you 
taking something small and you're expanding it but the expansion actually does simplify it if somewhere during your uh, pro procedure for integration you ended up with the following scheme over here cosine square 2x you know by using the property remember i'm showing you examples there you know by using the property over here where cosine square x is equal to 1 plus cosine 2x over 2 you can actually do something over here you can open it up and this right here is with regards to dx you can separate this out as 1 plus cosine 4x over 2 dx and then let's use the properties of integrals over here and separate we're not solving anything here we're just showing how the properties of integrals work out you have a 1 over 2 and you have a plus you can separate out as this 1 over 2 dx you see this 1 and this 2 has been separated out with its own dx plus this uh, 1 over 2 is still attached to there's a cosine 4x that has its own half attached to it cosine 4x dx you see how, uh, how i've separated this out this has been separated out into this even here you can do a substitution rule and do if u is equal to 4x then du is equal to 4dx and you'll see all of this play out we can rewrite all of this again in another more simplified way you'll still have the first item stay the same this next item will become 1 over 2 you'll have cosine u and then you'll have a du you'll see all of this you can rewrite again all of this using the properties of integrals dx plus 1 over 8 cosine u du or you can see how using the properties of integrals the positive the minus the constants how all of that plays out in the expansion of integrals the expansion of integrals is unique because it enables you to simplify complex integrals and separate them out expand them out such into simpler forms and those simpler forms can then go through the process of integration and it can actually be easier Let's talk about some more other properties of integrals and that'll be pretty much it for this video. So what exactly is the difference between a definite integral and an indefinite integral? We're talking about definite and indefinite. Let's use this for our symbol of integral so we don't have to write it all out. Definite versus an indefinite. Well, you already know what a definite integral is. It has a specific interval right there's an interval which is mentioned over here it could be anything but i'm just using a to b it could be zero to a zero to b whatever but there is no interval over here mentioned right your result over here your result of integration is always a numerical quantity right you have a numerical quantity which comes out numerical quantity let's use abbreviations over here quant the result over here for a definite integral which undergoes integration as a numerical quantity, but the result for a indefinite integral actually happens to be a function plus c. What is this plus c? We'll talk about it. Look over here. If you do a definite, these are basically the two prime differences is the presence of an interval and the lack of interval and what your actual result is. And here the result is actually a function. Let's look at a quick example, uh, an easy example of both using the same type of function. If supposedly we're doing a interval of 1 comma 0 for x square and we're doing the integration of it, of this this right here is a definite integral because there's a definite interval which you are integrating over you have a definite interval over which you are determining the area under the curve the interval over here is 1 comma 0 and your answer over here is basically x cube over 3 once you do the integration and you, your final answer ends up being 1 over 3. This right here is an example of a definite in integral. A definite integral. Let's just call it a definite integral. Now, the exact same question in, in terms of an indefinite integral would look like this. x squared dx. You see there's no 1 and there's no 0. There's no interval noted over here. But now look at what your answer is going to be. Your answer over here is going to be x cubed over 3 plus c. This right here was your answer for a definite integral. This right here is your answer for an indefinite integral. See, indefinite integral. And look how these two answers differ vastly. One is a numerical quantity, which you'll always have with a definite integral. You'll always have just like some sort of a mathematical numerical answer, which clearly tells you what is. The indefinite integral does only provide you a function. That's all what it does. It takes your one function and converts it, converts it into another function. Now I'm not talking about derivatives and antiderivatives or the inverses here at all because I'm not willing to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus just yet but that's exactly where we are headed with this discussion anyways 
But here, this is what your answer would be, x cubed over 3 plus c. What this c is, is a constant of integration, which basically represents you're getting this extra factor, which you're not getting with this, because this extra factor, which you would normally get with a definite integral, when you do this integration over these two intervals, one interval b, one interval a, those c's cancel out. You basically have an effect with definite in integrals where the plus c and you have a minus c occur with the integration and they cancel out. You see they cancel out so you don't end up getting a c. Here you end up getting a c, a constant of integration because you have no interval you're dealing with. So it just sticks. It's like for mathematical completeness sake that if you actually were to bring in an interval, the c would disappear. But so long as you don't have this interval, this constant of integration represents the fact that you have no interval over which you're integrating. Therefore, for completeness sake, you are putting a C over here because of the lack of a defined interval for your integral. So pretty much that's the difference between a definite and an indefinite integral. Definite integrals are mathematically harder only because you have to not make a silly mistake when you're actually doing your calculation over the two intervals. The process is exactly the same because you're still going to end up with a function in both of these except in a definite integral the function is going to carry be carried forward by the effect of the two intervals the two interval points the upper limit and the lower limit it's still one interval but each but the interval has an upper limit and a lower limit that function is going to be affected by that upper and lower limit and it will give you a numerical quantity in the indefinite integral you get the same step except you don't take it forward because you have no interval upper and lower limit to affect your function with and this represents your final answer. So keep in mind the difference between an indefinite and a definite. Now for the closure of this video the last two things I want to talk about is how you can manipulate your intervals for the purposes of integration as they become necessary. If supposedly you have a specific and we're using conceptual examples here only because we haven't learned the process of integration we're having to use conceptual examples but that's fine. If supposedly you have something which looks like this over the interval a, b, and you know this interval would be represented as this a comma b on a number line. If supposedly both of these are positive, I'm just saying hypothetically they're both positive, where a is greater than zero and b is greater than zero, you know on a number line you'd have zero, you'd have a, and you'd have b, right? In, in this order, a would come first, the lower limit, and b will come second in terms of being further away from zero. You can uh, rewrite all of this by manipulating the interval using a minus look over here it becomes now a and b and you get f of x and dx you see how this minus has flipped the interval around such that now your interval is basically b comma a and you can see this effect play out over here that's a very useful technique which you will see come into play when you're doing some integration questions but this is a good example over here a conceptual example that you should be keeping in your mind when you start learning how to do integration techniques. So keep this right here, property in mind. You can also see this example play out in a less conceptual way. Like if supposedly you had a question which was f of x dx. I'm not doing anything more than this in terms of numerical example. This is the extent of our uh, conceptual example right here. It's supposedly something which looked like this x and pi where you have this variable and you have this constant. You know pi is a constant in terms of it being a mathematical quantity, you can rewrite this interval as this. You see x will come on the top and pi over here on the bottom, and you see f of x dx, exact same technique. Your interval has been manipulated such that now your variable is the upper end of the limit, and your constant, which is originally the upper end, has become the lower limit, and you flip the limits around. Here's, let's, let's look at another example right over here. A similar example, you can see how how I'm doing all of this. If you had something which looked like this, 0 and tan x, you see the tan x here represents some kind of a variable and your function is f of x dx. You can rewrite all of this as a minus and bring your tan x over here and your interval has been manipulated a little more clearly. You see this minus and you still have f of x dx. This is how you can manipulate your intervals. I want to show you one more manipulation technique and that'll be it for this video. Somewhere near the beginning of this video I was talking about an example as you saw for a given function which was continuous if you had like supposedly an a over here and you know you had a c over here and you had a b over here you could represent both of these and you know what I'm talking about over here you could combine them together this can add with that for a cumulative effect remember this b a f of x let's just write f of x 
forget the dx part just for space limitations plus c b f of x and you know if there's a dx over here this could all equal a certain item the combined effect of all from c to a you remember that uh, what i was talking about something with regards to this type of a this type of an interval a function which is continuous over this look over here at this other property i'm trying to talk about and it's this if you have anything which has a function which is consistently continuous over a given interval you can split it up such as this look this x represents some value in between a and b now i'm talking about an interval a comma b within this interval a comma b if this was a this was right b this happens to be some other item in between a variable x or another constant or whatever you can split your intervals like this and then this x right here you see a to x a to x then x to b x to b this is what i'm exactly showing you how you can manipulate your parental integral function and break it up into its two like children functions integral functions you can see that so this is another type of property you should be aware of because you might sometimes have to break your interval into another item in between and that item you see over here plays right over here and over here and you're going from a to x a to x then x to b x to b and you see that i'll show you some very quick examples of this with something less conceptual and we're not going to be doing any numerical manipulation. I'm just showing you how you can manipulate the interval only. And then we'll be closing with that. You could have some function which looks like this. And you want to split this up into its parts. You can do it like this. Look over here. 2x to 0 and then 0 to 3x. Right? And I'll show you. You'll have 2x over here and then 0 on the top. And all I'm showing is how you can split up with whatever number might be in between. We don't know if there's really a zero in between. There could be a zero in here, who knows? I'm just using that as an example. And you have a three X over here and F of X DX. You see how I've split it up? And you can do another manipulation here using the property you learned before using the minus sign. If you want to keep this variable above because if supposedly two X is a number larger than zero, but here you're representing two X here as a lower limit, which is mathematically impossible. If supposedly your interval is zero, in terms of being small to large, 0, 2x, and 3x, because these are all positives, you cannot say mathematically that 0 is greater than 2x or 2x is less than 0, when in fact, when in fact mathematically that right there is what you really have. You can't do that. So, but you can do, you can get away with this by using a minus sign. Look, when you bring in a minus sign, you can bring the 2x up over here on the top, and you can do f of x, dx, because you already have your variable on the top here, the 3x stays, and you have that effect play out properly over here. You see how we split the 2x, 3x into 2x, 0, 0, 3x, but then we brought the 2x on the top as the upper limit because it maybe should not have been a lower limit, but we use the minus sign, we brought it up. And you see how it opened up and the effect of the minus sign over here and the effect of the splitting of the original interval. This is what I'm talking about with these last two properties. All right, here's a supposedly a function that you have to integrate from this to this interval, right? But you want to split it up for the process of your integration and you can there's nothing wrong with you doing that you can split it up by always using a zero you see how you can keep the secant x down here and you can bring a zero here on the top and you have your f of x dx over here this could be actually some real function over here and your zero stays down here see zero and zero and your x squared on the top you haven't mathematically spoiled anything over here because think about it secant x over here was a lower limit and i have a lower limit x squared was the upper limit and i have it as the upper limit and there's nothing you've done wrong over here by doing this and if supposedly you needed to bring the secant x up you could by using that minus technique again and there's nothing wrong with you doing that at all you might want to do this technique not for any reason other than if you had secant x as the upper limit it might have just made your calculation easy and because you brought it up and you didn't want to corrupt anything by bringing it up you just bring a minus sign and that minus sign will automatically self-correct any of the manipulation you've done by bringing the secant x up from the lower limit to upper limit so this minus is like a correcting technique over here by bringing the secant x upwards over here right and maybe spoiling or corrupting your answer the minus balances that harmful effect of shifting it up and you automatically balance whatever it is you're doing because in essence you you might not realize what this uh, it, integration involves when you're doing b over here you're basically doing you're basically doing whatever your value was over here you're minusing it 
with the b value n and you're doing minusing the function with the a value and that's what the whole integration of the definite integrals is you put the b value into your into your solved function after you've integrated it you put the b value in it you minus from it the a value which is why when you bring a minus over here and you're shifting it up it balances things out because the integration over an interval always represents the upper limit being put into your final answer and minusing from that the lower limit placed into your answer so you have a minus over here and you're putting a minus over here. The minus over here is part of just the integration process which you do over a defined limit. You'll see all of this when you get into the actual calculations. But keep all of these properties in mind that I've talked about in this video. I know there might have been quite a few properties. I tried to keep the subject as easy as possible because if you do look at all of these in your textbook, it can get quite complicated because of the way they probably present the material. I hope I tried to present the material in a more easy manner for you all and I hope you enjoyed this video. So stay tuned, I have now the real integral videos coming up next where we actually learn the integration techniques. So please stay tuned, have a nice day, bye.